Can I um, open this me meeting and welcome you to this 11th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent? Can I also add that I understand that a minute's silence will be held in the Parliament at 11 o'clock today as a mark of respect for those who have been affected by the events in Manchester on Monday night. If we are still considering petitions at that time, I would intend to suspend the meeting for a brief period before 11 o'clock so that we are able to show our respect for all affected, particularly those who died or were injured and their friends and families. If we can move then to agenda item number one, um, petition 1408, updating of pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. So the first item on our agenda this morning is petition 1408 by Andrea MacArthur on updating of pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. We are joined this morning by the Minister for Public Health and Sport, Aileen Campbell, MSP. The Minister is accompanied by Elizabeth Sadler, Deputy Director of Planning and Quality at the Scottish Government, and Dr Padmina Mishra, Senior Medical Officer in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. Can I thank you for joining us this morning? And I understand the Minister would like to make an opening statement, and I shall allow time for that before we move to questions from the Committee. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, pernicious anemia can cause significant uh, impact to the daily lives of those with the condition. People can be unwell for some time, having experienced difficulties in obtaining diagnosis and appropriate treatment. That's why I would like to commend Mrs MacArthur for her determination and work to support all people living with the condition in Scotland. And I recognise that the committee may ask questions of a more clinical nature, and, and for that reason, as you've outlined, Convener, I'm accompanied by Dr Mishra, one of the senior medical advisors in the CMO's office, and Liz Sandler, Deputy Director of Planning and Quality. This petition was launched, lodged in 2011, and at that time I understand that Mrs MacArthur hoped that the then guidelines available for GPs would be overhauled and updated. And this has been achieved by the publication of the British Committee for Standards and Haematology Guidelines, which were published in 2014. The petition made several requests and I would like to outline how those have been met. Uh, one, a greater awareness of common sets of symptoms experienced by people suffering from a uh, deficiency in vitamin B12. Uh, the GP training curriculum includes investigation related to all types of anemia, including pernicious anemia, and as such GPs are expected to be able to address the signs and symptoms of a patient presenting with pernicious anemia. The BSH guideline further supports healthcare professionals in the assessment and diagnosis of pernicious anemia. The second point was an overhaul of the diagnostic test used, adopting the active B12 and uh, homocysteine and MMA tests to be used regularly. Now, I understand there is no uh, definitive test for diagnosing uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, and this is an area for experts in haematology and has been addressed in the guideline. And the committee will understand that it is not appropriate for Scottish ministers or their policy officials to intervene or contradict the evidence-based guidance produced by specialists in this field. Her next point requested uh, that patients displaying advanced symptoms be automatically offered trail injections of vitamin B12. And again, the BSH guidelines state that this could be considered. The petitioner also asked that folate and ferritin be checked and other coexistings checked as well. And the BSH guideline also provides advice on folate deficiency, coexisting conditions and provision of folic acid. And lastly, the petitioner asked for patients to be able to self-inject vitamin B12 as and when they need it. All matters of treatment are for discussion and agreement between the individual and the clinician concerned. And this is not and cannot be a matter for Scottish ministers to become involved in. In relation to self-injecting, I've been advised that it can be challenging to self-administer as this is an intramuscular injection and there are risks associate, associated with it. As a result, some patients may not wish to, con to, uh, to do this. It therefore needs to be a matter of discussion between the individual and the clinician that is concerned. Turning now specifically to the guidance, uh, the BSH guidelines addressed the majority of the issues raised in the petition. However, at the time of publication, Scottish Government advisers felt that the guidelines were not in a suitable format for use in GP practices. That is, they were not in the format that GPs were familiar with, like the sign or NICE guidelines. As a result, the Scottish Haematology Society were asked to prepare a draft summary document of the guidelines. An initial draft was prepared, however, the SHS advised the committee that owing to the level of work required to complete the document, they had taken the decision to withdraw from the process, leaving the document in draft. Committee members will be well aware that it is not the role of the Scottish Government to publish clinical guidelines or summary documents derived from them. However, I wish to make it clear that the content of the BSH guideline was considered relevant and appropriate for adoption by Scottish clinicians, and this remains extant. 
In addition, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence produced a clinical knowledge summary on anemia, B12 and folate deficiency in 2015. These summaries are designed to be concise, accessible summaries of current evidence for primary care professionals and are also in a format that GPs are familiar with. Our position is that the requests of the petitioner have been met. Uh, and going forward, the Chief Sci Scientist Office uh, will the, within the Scottish Government with responsibility for the funding of clinical research in Scotland, we'd welcome applications for research projects aimed at the diagnosis and treatment of people with pernicious anemia. And the petitioner may wish to consider that route aided by Pernicious Anemia Society to identify researchers willing to move that forward. So again, I hope this addresses the substantive points of the petition. It illustrates the progress that has been made, and I'm happy to take questions from the committee. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, as you said yourself, this petition um, has been under consideration since 2011, as the committee had been waiting for the development of suitable clinical guidance. And in the first instance, as again, as you say, we were waiting for the publication of the British Society for Haematology's guidelines, which were published in 2014. And more recently, we have been waiting for the Scottish Government to publish a summary of these guidelines, which the Scottish Haematology Society was asked to produce. I wonder if it would be helpful if you could explain why the summary document was commissioned, what it cost, and what outcomes it hoped to achieve. Well, I think the original, as I outlined in my uh, opening remarks, the reason had been that the considered opinion at the time had been that the the guidance from the BSH was within a, with, was in a format that might not have been uh, that might not GPs might not have been used to. Um, so there was nothing, uh, no no question about the the content, no question about the guidelines uh, them, themselves. The issue was around the format, and that was why there was a, a, a request to the uh, the SHS to produce a summary. Uh, there. That didn't happen, that's not uh, been completed, it still remains in draft format, but then since then there has also been NICE, uh, uh, a knowledge summary produced by NICE, which is in the format that GPs are used to, so there is a, a plethora of information there for GPs to access on this condition. Mm -hmm. When you say that at the time it was considered uh, not to be appropriate, does that mean now you do think what British um, um, SH guidelines that are appropriate the in fact while you said the question was about the format mm -hmm. at the time the, the advice was more than just the format it was that BSHA guidelines were not suitable for the Scottish practice setting it raised concerns that the second line testing recommended by the BSHA guidelines is not standard in Scottish laboratories so it was format but there was something else as well I mean do you agree with that or has that opinion changed it, it was around the format. There was never no, any question no, sorry, around the respect, content. No, with respect, Minister, it says it raised concerns that the second line's testing recommended by the BSH guidelines is not standard in Scottish laboratories and the format was an issue. There's two separate things. The, and, if, and another thing as well to remember is that the NICE have published uh, guidelines as well, which have taken from the, the, the BHS uh, guidelines uh, as well. So there, those are complementary. Those are they don't contradict one another. The issue was around the way in which it was presented. There was never any question around the content well, of that or the guidance. I respect that's not the evidence that we were given before. I'm asking if you've changed your opinion on that. Um, Dr. Michelle, the opinion has been the same, that the guidelines that was developed by the British um, Hematological Society took two years to develop. So Scottish clinicians never questioned those guidelines, and that includes GPs. It was just that it was not, they weren't used to reading their guidelines, the society's guidelines. They're much more used to re reading guidelines that come at them more frequently from GMC and other areas and sign and nice everything. But so there hasn't been a change of opinion in the sense of what is recommended in the guidelines. It is that there is no definitive test available. You have to take the account of the person's clinical condition first and foremost. And then, if required, try empirical treatment, if, even if the tests are negative, because they could be negative. And that is the issue. It still doesn't, for me, it doesn't explain why at the time they were deemed not to be suitable. If it were just format, 
Presumably that would be a relatively straightforward thing to do. If it didn't really matter that much, you wouldn't have asked the Scottish Hematological Society to, to do more work for you. And if it did matter, I would have thought you would have found somebody else to do the work that the Hematological Society wasn't able to do. But I mean, if I can maybe ask my colleagues to ask some point, The important point also is to recognise that NICE have produced a clinical knowledge summary in 2015, which is in, a, which is in a format that GPs can use. So there is, and that doesn't contradict anything that's within the original BSH uh, guidelines. Uh, so there is a concise format there for GPs to use. There is also the much more uh, in-depth uh, mm -hmm. uh, format with that's produced with, with respect that I'm, I'm, telling, I'm saying that the, mm -hmm. there is a format there for GPs to mm -hmm. use, which has happened since the point in which this well, petition was launched. I think we would need maybe to test some of that because there does seem to be a contradiction between saying there was a problem and now there's not a problem. But anyway, even if there were a problem, it's OK because NICE has produced um, information. But anyway, uh, Angus MacDonald. Thanks, <coughs> convener. Good morning, Minister. I'm looking at the SHS's work. Um, you, you've perhaps touched on this in, in your opening remarks. However, the, the submission dated uh, the 12th of October 2016 uh, from the Scottish Government explained that, and I quote, has no plans to publish any draft uh, incomplete adaptation undertaken by SHS, um, end of quote. Um, can you clarify to what extent the SHS's work is incomplete? Um, and we've well, already uh, told us why the Scottish Government decided not to publish it, but what aspect of it was incomplete? Well, there has to be a... There ha excuse me, sorry. There has to be a... Um, there has to be a set of kind of processes that have gone through as well. So, and, and I know that Miss Lamont said that it, that it would be a straightforward process. However, taking making a concise document out of something that's quite in depth it does require a lot of discipline. It requires a lot of work and effort to make sure that there is nothing missed, nothing omitted, and also nothing in that kind of maybe over over uh, states a, a particular way in which you should approach a a, a system. Uh, there's also uh, been no uh, consultation on on the on the document, and there's not been that level of peer uh, review and uh, research that has uh, looked at the, the the guidance. So it would not be appropriate; it wouldn't be responsible for government uh, or anybody at this point in time to uh, publish this summary document. Okay. Again, though, I would go point back that since then, Nice have published uh, a knowledge summary there, which is in a format that GPs can use, which does not con contradict in any way, uh, but complements the uh, existing guidance from the BSH, and therefore there is quite a, a significant amount of uh, information there on hand and ready to be used by, by GPs and clinicians across the country. And have you had any indication from GPs that uh, they're, they're, they're not satisfied with uh, uh, the, the, the nice advice? Yeah. Not aware of any, not, not even aware of any issues from GPs that have been raised on the BSH uh, guidelines either. Okay. So nothing has been raised with us from clinicians. With respect to the Scottish Government itself that said there the are problems with the BSH guidelines, not the GPs. That was the considered view of the Scottish Government in evidence to the, to the committee. Angus? But it, well, yeah, it's, it's still helpful, Convener, to know whether there is any feedback from the GPs, and there doesn't seem to be. Okay. Uh, Brian um, morning, Minister. Just following on, on from the, those points, is the Scottish Government explained in its submission uh, on the 26th of November 2016 that it would share the draft version of the SHS's summary document with the Public Petitions Committee only once the Diagnostic Steering Group were satisfied with the draft. The committee received a copy of the summary draft document after it was approved by the Diagnostic Steering Group. Can you clarify whether the group's view on the summary document has changed? And if the group's view has not changed, can you then cl again clarify in these circumstances uh, why the Scottish Government will not publish it? The summary document has not been approved, um, therefore um, it won't, it's, not to, it's not going to be published. I could add here. So the summary document went to the um, diagnostic steering group, and that's the version that this committee has seen. The committee asked Mrs. MacArthur if she had any comments on the the draft, and she had a number of comments which she made to the to the SHC. They responded to those comments, and that was the point at which um, they withdrew from the process before. Um, they were able to take it because they felt that they were being asked to change the content of the um, guidance rather than just summarising the original guidance. Um, so that was a, so 
the document was never finalised and has not been back to the Diagnostic Steering Group again since the version that um, the committee has seen. So does that, does that mean then that uh, the view in the summary document has actually changed in the Diagnostic Steering Group? No, no, because it was to be a summary. The, the purpose of the document is a summary document of the um, original guidelines. It was not about changing the guidelines because everybody is... Um, the, cl the clinical consensus is that the original guidelines remain valid. Um, so the S as the SHS rem removed themselves from the process before they could finalise the document, we're not in a position as government to, um, to publish it. So I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm I, I just from from my from my just for, for my uh, benefit here. Does that then mean that it was it was the um, the, summary, the summary document was was not uh, didn't reflect the original document? And there and there is that, is that the, what it means? Yes, it does reflect the oh. original document, <laughs> but it is not in a form that has been. By, the SHS did not formally sign it off, and therefore um, not did not give government a final version that could go to yeah, the diagnostic it's not, it's steering not group. They withdrew before they did that. It, and, and the SHS document is not contradictory to the original BSH guidelines that were uh, issued. Uh, and that was the process that was being asked to change that. that. That was never the request of the SHS. This was to just change the format to ensure that it was accessible for, for GP use. However, again, I would go back. NICE have since produced a clinical uh, knowledge summary there. So there is a concise, usable uh, understandable format for GPs that they are used to uh, as well. So the SHS request of them was never to change anything within the guidelines that were set from the BSH. Sorry, could I just give you... If, 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 there's, if there's nothing within the document that contradicts the NICE document, I still don't get why we can't publish it. It's not being approved. It's not being approved. So it, it can't be approved then? Well, I don't... If the SHS are out, is that what you're saying? They can't be approved because the SHS are not involved anymore? But there's no... So there's no need for it now. There is, there's nice clinical guide... There's nice clinical knowledge summary uh, which presents the information to GPs which they use, which, again, in response to Angus MacDonald's line of question, no GP has raised any concern over that. That follows on and flows from the BHSH's original uh, guidance, which uh, at that time had been considered to be uh, in a format that wasn't used, uh, wasn't uh, that GPs weren't as as used to. Uh, so what has happened since then is that Nice have produced clinical uh, a clinical knowledge summary, and there is uh, plenty information there for uh, GPs to to use. Uh, furthermore, as well, um, there is much more uh, um, authority attached to the the Nice guidelines as well. So the the SHS's uh, work, um, considerable work and effort that's been put in, uh, is no longer as necessary or deemed as necessary as it perhaps had been at the time which the BSH uh, published their uh, guidelines. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much um, at the risk of repeating ourselves. Um, just, to, just to clarify that um, regardless of, of what's happened over the, the publication and, and, uh, or non-publication of documents, you're satisfied that there is, you and the GPs are satisfied that there is an, enough information Within the NICE document and the BHS, uh, the, the BSH document, to provide comprehensive guidelines, and there's no um, there's no sort of ambiguity about any of it. There's no nothing that the NICE uh, clinical knowledge summary, uh, the BSH uh, guidelines. There is nothing that contradicts mm -hmm. either document. The NICE clinical knowledge summary is in a format that GPs. Uh, are used to, and we've had no GP contact, as far as I'm aware, that um, to raise any questions about uh, or question the the guidelines or request any uh, additional information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, morning, Minister and colleagues. Um, what's been the demand for the second line testing in Scotland since the BSH's guidelines were introduced, and how is this being met? Maybe. Uh, Dr. Mishra, can I ask you to? Um, we haven't got any. Um, evidence to say how much it's increased or decreased by the guidelines. But what the guidelines uh, suggest is the diagnosis is not clear-cut, so if it is required, then clinicians can access the second-line tests. It's not universally available in Scotland, in Scottish laboratories, but it is available to them from elsewhere. Can I ask something to that? Why is it not universally available in Scotland? 
the tests themselves are not dependable. So what you can surmise from a result, whether positive or negative, may not necessarily help with the management of a case. So it is difficult to interpret these tests. And so it is therefore more research is required to get things like standardization of the test, cutoff points, what is actually a low level, what is a subclinical level, these are not available yet. And so for clinicians, it is difficult, and it's in the realm of not GPs, but specialists and researchers at present. Can I ask, sorry, just a wee follow on. Minister, what's been done about that? Um, well, the you know, the, as I said in my opening remarks, the, um, the Chief Scientist Office is um, willing and able to take on um, research uh, proposals uh, from um, researchers and um, and so there is an opportunity there to progress that um, if there is a, a suitable um, if there's a suitable uh, 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 um, submission made to the um, the CSO. Okay, thank you. Can I ask are you actively seeking submissions as opposed to seeing if somebody has a research proposal we would consider it, which I think is helpful. Are you actively going out and asking you know? seeking submissions for this work to be done? Um, the submissions come from either uh, patients, the public, or the clinicians. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not up to governments to ask them, to uh, the CSO, to look at research proposals. We have asked the uh, CSO to act, um, look at it positively when a pro proposal in this area arrives. That's all we can do to encourage the CSO to keep an open mind in this area and um, make them aware that this is an area of need. But we can't set up the proposals. It has to be a researcher that can't approaches them. I understand mm -hmm. that, but very often in government, you, see, you actually actively go out and ask. You create a project and say, we want a researcher to do yes. this job. And, and not clearly the government ministers are not the technical or clinical expertise to do that. We say we identify there's a need and we will actively go now, create a, an option and ask people to bid for that work. There's also the, um, the National Network Management uh, Service has also pursued and established the, the establishment of a short life working group for haematology and that will uh, be able to pursue some of the issues raised in the petition as well as the um, issues of research. So, so there is, there is, there's the, there's, there's the short life working group on haematology, and there's also the, um, you know, the, the, the keenness for the CSO's office to be able to receive any submission around further research. Can you not be the other way around? That you see there is this job to be done, and we're asking for bids for that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding. I, I appreciate there may be technicalities I'm not aware of, and clearly people make research bids all the time. But if you recognise there's a need for this work to be done. Can you create a, a, a project which says, will you now bid to do this work? Well, like I said, you know, this is work that's been taken forward by the Short Life Working Group, which we can consider all of those elements as well. Again, aside from that, though, the, the Chief Scientist Office is also uh, able to accept uh, from researchers bids to pursue and progress other areas of research. So there's two very clear routes forward to further enhance the research knowledge and uh, capacity on this issue. I was going to ask Rona to come in at this point. You want to ask your question? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's really for Doc, Dr. Mishra. Um, I'm just, you know, you were saying it's, it's more or less up to the clinician's individual judgment at the moment because there's no standardised um, diagnostic testing. Is there any sort of pattern emerging in, in, in how that's been done? Do you have any sort of data which shows what's the most likely outcome of, of those, those uh, decisions? The, there isn't any data which is readily available. This is, um, so the British um, Hematology Society also acknowledged that uh, you don't have randomized controlled trials in this area. And what they recommended was a pragmatic approach. So every, because every uh, individual patient starts from a different level, it's very difficult to compare from the beginning of their journey to the end. So some are treated and it depends on patient preference. So some would like a lot of testing done, some would like just the treatment, some would like to wait and see. So it is very difficult to find any data about it. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Morris, you want to yeah, no, I just find it slightly staggering that you know, if there's this need for the second line testing, Minister, that you know the government should take the lead on this and, and clearly you know sort of fire off the, the gun to start the, the research on it. Well, we've got the short life working group. It's yeah, been but, established. Right. Okay. And they haven't come to the conclusion yet as to what they're doing. It's it's just it's it's in, in the process of being established and this could started. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Looking at this gap round second line testing, it, it, it intends to look at uh, the management of vitamin B12 deficiency in the realm, in the totality. That's the initial intention. Once they set the group up, then they will decide their remit. And if there's a requirement, and look at the gaps that require more guidance, more research work, and that's the aim of it. So they're keen to do some work in this area, but not exclusively. Um, on testing, it's the general management of vitamin B12 deficiency. But, so the government has set up the short life working group. The membership. No, it's the, nat it's the national, national services division that have set that up. National service division of. Uh, the national yeah. service division are part of um, NSS, NHS NSS, National Services Scotland, um, and they run a series of um, managed networks across a range of um, disorders, and they have a managed diagnostic network um, and that group has set up the short life working group on haematology uh, which is looking at uh, the b12 deficiency mm -hmm. so it would be useful to get a note then on the membership of that and the yep. remit, i'm assuming that the government will have input into the remit and we'll be able to say that this would be an issue that would be worth given that you've said there's an area where you'd like to see research if we were saying actively we want to encourage this research that would be part of the remit yes so we can get you that information and we can ensure that the the, the network and the, the short life working group understand the particular interests of the committee? Well, if the short life working group is partly in response to this recognition as work is getting done, I'm just interested in... Yeah, I'm trying to be... Uh, forgive me, I'm trying to be uh, uh, helpful just to see that we can uh, let you know the, the group, uh, the, the membership, and ensure that they know the interest that your committee has. And the time scale. And I mean, I genuinely, I'm interested in the extent to which, as government, you've recognised this gap in the research, how you actively will ensure that research is taking place. And I suppose yeah. that could be included as part of the information you provide us around the, the working group. Um, Brian Whittle. Um, the committee has asked the Scottish Government to consult with the petitioner on the development of the draft summary document from the outside and, and outset. And in this regard, the SHS commented when withdrawing from the process, and I quote, uh, the very considered responses we received from the petitioner in response to the draft guidelines indicate the limitations our small society has in trying to produce specific Scottish guidelines. And the committee understands from the petitioner's submissions that she's particularly concerned, and I apologise for my um, pronunciation here, um, about gastric parental uh, cell antibody testing and does not agree with the way this issue is addressed in the BSH's guidelines. The Scottish uh, Haematology Society does not appear to have the capacity to address these concerns and the petitioner considers she has not been listened to for this reason. And I wonder if you'd be willing to, to commit your officials to meet with the petitioner to discuss her concerns about the testing procedures for pernicious anemia and the vitamin B12 deficiency. Yeah, um, I would, uh, if, if um, the petitioner wishes to meet officials, that, that will be, um, we'll happily uh, arrange that. However, it would be worth recognising that we do not have the ability to change clinical guidelines or clinical uh, guidance or the knowledge summaries because of the robust processes that they've all gone through in, word, in order to create that um, evidence base and that peer research uh, that has um, uh, brought them to bear and that are currently in use. So while my officials would be entirely happy to make sure that we can engage with the petitioner to make sure that we understand fully her concerns or any outstanding concerns following the responses that we've had to each point of her petition. I, I think it's important to recognise that we are not in a position, or my officials are not in a position to um, change uh, the guidelines, uh, but certainly we can make sure that if there are avenues to, um, you know, to, to, to ensure that the, the, the short life working group understands her continued concerns, then, then we can happily do that. But I think it's important to recognise the parameters and the restrictions that we have around changing guidelines that are being clinically uh, looked at. Um, the Scottish Government did, however, take a view that BSHA guidelines were inadequate and asked the Scottish... If, if, 
they asked the Scottish Haematology Society. So, so I don't think anybody's suggesting that government ministers have to sit down and write out clinical guidance. But there must be capacity within the system on the request of the Scottish Government for things to be done. The Scottish Government did request the Scottish Haematology Society do it. So I don't think the issue is, we're not, nobody's pretending that you as a government minister are capable of making clinical decisions. Nobody in here can. But your government is capable of saying, we think there's a gap here and, and can you look at it? And that is really where I think a lot of this has emerged. Can I ask if... Sorry, can we just... in response to that, I just... I just think it was important to be clear that while we are happy, absolutely happy to engage with the petitioner and recognise the huge amount of work she's put into this, I think it's important to put on record that that will not re result in a change to the to the clinical guidelines that are already in existence. And again, I just reiterate the point that there was never any uh, doubt over the uh, veracity or the uh, the accuracy or what the guidelines said, it was around the format of that. But, well, with respect, we've already heard that it was a bit more than that. It was also about the fact that second-line testing is not available in Scotland. And the Scottish mm, Government that itself... That was never a part of The Scottish of it. Government itself recognised the need to do more than simply format it. But, but however, mm, mm, I recognise no, what you've said about... The nice, uh, I, th advice. I think also, with respect, with, with respect I, I think you're downplaying the summary. The, the summary is can important the work. I'm sorry. <laughs> can I finish the point? We recognise the work that's been done. So the question that still is asked is how government is proactive around recognising that the, the work that you yourself asked to be done wasn't completed and work that you yourself recognise needs to be done in research, how that is now completed. Can I ask in relation to the short life working group, will it have patient representation on it? And would it be possible for the, um, that group to meet with the petitioner? Um, I, I, like I say, I, I, you know, we'll explore with the officials what, what where we can make sure that the petitioner's views and voices is heard within that uh, and whether that's appropriate for the short life working group. Again, we'll reiterate that we'll get back in contact with you around the, the membership of, that, um, of the, the short life working group uh, as well. Okay. Okay, Ben. I mean, obviously, the petitioner will have heard the evidence and will be obviously responding to that. So we will make sure that the comments that she raises with us will be conveyed to you as well. Can I thank you very much for that? I think we recognise this is, is a petition that's been ongoing for some time and quite issues that probably not one person in here, maybe with certain honourable exception, really understand the clinical technicalities of all of this. And, you know, I think everyone recognises the role of the petitioner in pursuing the question. In terms of how we take this forward, um, I don't know what suggestions the committee has. I certainly think we would want to reflect on all of the information, including this, um, the Short Life Working Group um, and the, the, the NICE guidance and so on. I think the, these would all be useful things for us to look at. And we could maybe then reflect on that and, and what the Minister has said in this evidence session with an opportunity for the petitioner to respond and then we can come to view. I don't know if anybody has any other comment or suggestions. Angus? Convener, thanks. Um, I, I'd just like to thank the Minister for, for her evidence this morning. It, it certainly helped to, to um, clarify uh, the situation in, in, in my mind. And I, I think there are a couple of salient points in the evidence that have been, that's been given this morning. Um, one, the fact that the NICE Clinical Knowledge Summary has superseded any work by SHS. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, another salient point is the fact that there's been no negative feedback from the GPs on the, 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 the way the matter has been dealt with uh, up till now. So, um, so yeah, happy to reflect on, on the other evidence that's been given, but I think, I think these two salient points have to be stressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's helpful. Anything else? Right. My, 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 the niggling issue I have, I think, is the fact that, you know, uh, uh, Government, government initiated a body of work um, that the SHS uh, did uh, and produced some sort of draft guidelines, especially if it's collab collaborative, uh, collaborative evidence. There must be some way of bringing that out. I don't see why, and I don't know how relevant that is. I don't see why, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it doesn't contradict anything that's, that's been said under the next guidelines, why, you know, why that, that wouldn't be published as well. And I think... You know, it seems to me that the more evidence around this we have, the better. So. I mean, I think we, it, the issue for the Scottish Haematology Society is they felt they didn't have the capacity as a small organisation to do that. The question really is, 
is there any remaining work to be done given this new guidance and is it therefore that's it was useful work but we don't need to pursue it any further um and, and obviously through this we would hope through the short life working group that, that might be something that could be considered further News have been covered. I think that the minister's clarified that um, that that she and GPs are happy with the existing with the guidelines that have now been superseded the the the, S, the SHS ones. So um, I, I mean I'm I'm content with that. I don't think there's any there's any need for um, alarm in, in that respect. Okay. Um, Can I suggest just in my lifetime that we reflect on the evidence, give the petitioner an opportunity to respond, but also record our our. our um, Thanks to the, the Minister, both for her evidence and for the update and the information that we've been given around um, the new guidance or the nice information that's there. Um, and obviously look forward to hearing more about the Short Life Working Group. So can I thank you very much and those with you for attending. And can I suspend briefly? back to order and we move to agenda item number two on new petitions. The petition 1646 on drinking water supplies in Scotland. So we turn to agenda item two, consideration of new petitions, and we have two new petitions to consider this morning. The first is petition uh, 1646 by Caroline Hayes on drinking water supplies in Scotland. We will hear evidence from the petitioner and she's accompanied by Leslie Dudgeon, who is the Secretary of Kincraig and Vicinity Community Council. Um, 
And I can also welcome Kate Forbes, MSP, um, for this agenda item. Can I welcome you both to the meeting? You have the opportunity to make a brief opening statement of up to five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. I want to to you. Thanks very much for seeing us. Water is our most precious and important natural resource. It's vital to life, and Scotland has it in abundance. It's important for health, tourism, wildlife, and sustainable economy. Scottish Government have, has a responsibility for maintaining and improving the quality of all fresh water in Scotland. The Drinking Water Quality Regulator exists to enforce that the water is safe and pleasant to drink and has the trust of customers. Also ensure that further issues that may affect drinking water quality in Scotland are adequately understood and that any knowledge gaps are filled through research. In Badenoch and Strass Bay, since the change in 2012 from Loch Eineach to the aquifers in Kinnakail, there's been a problem with the, water that, with the water supply that the DWQR have still not acknowledged. This could be the tip of the iceberg for the whole of Scotland. The DWQR have been aware of the taste and odour um, uh, and skin irritations since 2012. No monitoring of Scottish waterers was done until the full audit in 2016, which concluded everything was normal and that there would be ongoing discussions with NHS, DWQ and Scottish Water, but none happened. Classified as a major event, DWQR, DWQR resolved to, to closely monitor water quality during chloramination. This again has produced no results. After the dissatisfaction of locals, Dew Henry MP, with Scottish Water commissioned an independent survey with appalling results for Scottish Water, having for them to, audit, to admit that the taste and odour was substandard. The health issues had been admitted from this survey, but after an open meeting with locals, they had to be addressed. It has taken five years. After this meeting with Dr. Ken Oates, Moira Watson, DWQR, and Peter Farrell's reinsurances are hollow by his reiterating the water is of a high quality and over the past five years and has consistently met strict standards. Because we know that this is not the case, Peter Farrell told us in January 2017, we would like to apologize that the taste of water does not come up to standards expected and it has also taken us longer to make improvements that it should have. This, uh, this same Peter Farrell says our mantra is about putting customers at the heart of our business. Um, those standards are not being picked up. That, no, the standards are not picking up the problems. Local doctors made their concerns to Public Health Board in 2012. Again, in 2015, why is the DWQR not investigating or enforcing the standards where are the long-term studies of the effects of chloramination? There are none. Scottish Water sent us this postcard. Okay? Scottish Water have now apologised, and to resolve the taste and odour issues, are adding ammonia to the chlorine. Chloramin um, chloramination, a water disinfectant, incidentally 200 times less effective than chlorine at killing E. coli, rotavirus, etc. But it's cheap and it's far more difficult to remove. But to what detriment to human health because of the disinfectant byproducts? They may simply be trading regulated DBPs for unregulated ones. And I've got them, but they're too difficult to pronounce. The NDMA iodinated DBPs and hydrazine. There are no risk assessments for the unregulated ones. There is also evidence of DP disinfectant byproduct exposure via inhalation during showering, but there have been no follow-up studies to confirm these risks. The Cranfield, Cranfield University studies concluded in the UK only one group of DBPs are regulated, the TTHMs, maximum 100 micrograms per litre at the taps. Further, in gestrin, further, in gestrin, sorry, further investigations are needed. There is limited sampling and more information on the occurrence of DNA, NDMA on health concerns is needed 
and for a number of chemicals, the toxic toxicity database is grossly inadequate or absent. DEFRA's concerns on iodinated DPP's lack of data make SANS assessments of risk posed in drinking water impossible. In the US, e the EPA on chloramines, there is not enough information. And the importance on the effect of weakened immune systems in infants, the LDD, those having chemo HIV, is incompatible, and its incompatibility for dialysis patients. Risk, assess risk assessments based on incomplete, incomplete data are not sound. And with the interaction of all the chemicals used within the industry, there are new new, no cumulative risk assessments. And therefore, this is not robust enough. The D D DWQR, its job is to monitor these risks. There are efficient... There are efficient and sustainable alternative solutions for water treatment based on iron exchange, UV ceramic membrane, and advanced oxidation, which offer lower life cycle costs, greater efficiency, and much more lower impact, sorry, lower environmental impact. Publicly owned companies have a responsibility. While evidence may be lacking that many chemicals pay, pose, may pose no significant threat to public health, Removing them is an additional benefit of treatment for other, for other purposes is advantageous. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, in the first part of your petition, you call for the role of the DWQR to be reviewed. And in the briefing that we've had prepared for us, uh, sets out in detail the DWQR's um, role as described in its website. I wonder if you've got any comments on the description of the role measured against your experience? Is there a gap between what they report themselves to be responsible for and your experience of what they've done in your case? They're not monitoring. They're not, they're not sampling. They're not monitoring. They're not um, assessing the information okay. and following up on it. They're not taking... Their job is to look at what happens within Scottish water and to monitoring it. They're not doing that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Angus MacDonald. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, convener. Um, good morning, Caroline. Good morning, Leslie. Um, you've perhaps covered this uh, in, in your opening uh, remarks and, and um, your answer to the, the convener's question, but um, the, the, the DWQR's own description of its role says that it exists to ensure three things, that drinking water is safe, that it's pleasant to drink and that it has the trust of consumers. It's not doing that. No, yes. that's just what I was going to ask. You. Is it fair to <laughs> so, say that? <laughs> you know, what's, what, what is there for? It's like a, I don't know, chocolate fire guard. <laughs> sorry. Okay. That's, I'm that's, sorry. I'm no, no, that's, that's very succinct, yeah. <laughs> um, just for clarification, though, um, you mentioned in your opening remarks uh, um, that there's been no cumulative uh, risk assessment. Okay, um. Um, okay, the Scottish the water industry puts lots of different chemicals. They put phosphates, which line the lead pipes. Okay, there's lots of places that I know around Aviemore that has lead pipes. The plumbers say when they cut into them, this stuff lines the pipes. And the, the, if you add the phosphate that they add for doing that, you add the ammonia, the chlorine, the, all of the yeah, all the chemicals together, they're not, yeah, exactly, well, they're not doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kina. Uh, good morning. Can I just ask a supplementary to, to um, um, Mr McDonald's question there? And in terms of the implementation of any recommendation, I mean, who has that responsibility? Implementation. If, if, there's, if there's recommendations in terms of uh, once the testing's done, if there, if there are issues with the water, in your opinion, who has that responsibility, or, or do you know who ha has the responsibility to ensure that recommendations are, are uh, enforced? Well, the, the, the GDWQR, so um, overseen by the Scottish, Scottish government. Uh, Scottish government. You know, it's all the Scottish government is there. Scottish Water is there, the DWQ and SEPA. All these agencies should be working together. They don't seem to be working together. 
Sorry, and maybe I'm not answering your question. No, no, you're very much sorry. Sorry. I'm not asking particularly good questions. Um, I mean, it's my understanding that SEPA don't have responsibility for private water. It's for public water. And, and what, I'm tr what I'm trying to get to is, is that uh, um, if, there's an issue with, if there's an issue with the water, and that's brought forward, so DWQR are the ones that do the monitoring, regulate the whole and industry and they're the ones that are supposed to have the the, the power to implement or to ensure that those recommendations are implemented that's that's really the question i'm asking so it's, it's their, 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 their responsibility sits with the dwqr i think they regulate themselves well yeah n nobody's that's regulating kind of them but scottish government should be regulating them mm -hmm. that's what we're asking you guys to look at that's, that's kind of a convoluted way I, I, oh, yeah, I, I got to sorry, the answer I'm not really I was looking sure. for. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah. Somebody, has to, somebody has to take responsibility for this. Um, um, we, can't, we have five years, we have been trying to bring this. We've had meetings, we've had... And Scottish Water just don't, don't listen. They send out standard replies. Yeah, they Everything's send it to doctors who get to the... Everything's fine. It's fallen within the regulations, and everything's um, within the normal parameters. We're running everything lovely, and that's that's it. And it just keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. They say that to the doctors. They say that to the um, the health the, the, the health, health professionals board. went to um, in 2012 when the water was changed over. The doctor in Aviemore went to the public health and. They got in touch with Scottish Water, who sent them a stock standard reply. The same happened again in 2015. They keep Scottish Water keep telling us there's no problems with the water. Okay. Uh -huh. in, in your background uh, to your petition, you say that despite carrying out a full audit of the DWQR, found no issue with the treatment works in your area. Exactly. Can you explain how that, that, that full audit came about and was this a regular audit as part of its Scottish wide audit programme or was it initiated at your request? Um, it, no, it came because um, there were complaints and there wasn't a major... Um, that so was got the DWQR saying that they're doing a few do full audit and there's no issues and then you've got Scottish Water sending this out to everyone saying if you're unhappy with your gut water, there's obviously a problem here, and good news, it's changing. So okay. you've got two agencies not working together. I've got this. this. I think this is what you asked. Between March and June 2016, 36 complaints were received by Scottish Water regarding water quality. They, um, they, they said this was an in, um, incident. Sorry. They knew... Um, Somebody of incident. The summer summary was unpleasant taste, skin and irritations. But they're not monitoring this. They hadn't done any monitoring. And that's their job. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, no, okay. yeah, they said the DWQR, the poor hole, they just say, we've got a state-of-the-art treatment, treatment plant. plant. And they keep fobbing us off that it's all working. And it's not. They had to clean out the pipes. There was... They cleaned out the pipes, the distribution pipes, and there was, they did it at night, but I happened to see the guy when he came. They get these, there was this black stuff that came out of the pipes. Where is that coming from? I don't know, there's a picture of it. We've got loads of pictures. Mm -hmm. Any information that you've brought along that will be circulated to the committee afterwards? Brona uh, Mackay. Thank you, Dina. Good morning, Leslie and Caroline. Um, can I just ask you, our briefing pack tells us that um, chloramination, which is what Scottish Water are now doing to the water in, in your area, yeah. is widely used throughout the UK and you know that they plan to expand it for use throughout Scotland. So are you aware of any other problems throughout the UK or, or any other um, you know, problems and experience that, that you have? Or? Well, we know that there have been problems in Fort William with the with mm -hmm. and they chloramate, mm -hmm. chloramination in Fort William, and I know that they've had problems. I'm, I'm trying we've to extend it beyond Scottish Water yes. because obviously, if it's throughout the UK, it won't be Scottish Water that are doing it south of the well, border. Well, in Wales, they don't have these so. problems because they don't put chloramines in the water. Yeah, but it, but yeah, okay. Uh, so, I. C Sorry, you think it's you, been so, so I'm, I'm trying to su yeah. sort of suggest is it, it's particularly localised to you. No, no, they put chloramines, but I don't think... I think there's 14 um, 
places in the UK that have chloram chloramination in their water. Uh -huh. A lot of these places don't know they've got it. Um, and, the, and, and as far as you, I mean, ha has that chloramination improved your water? No. Right. It's metallic. We would have brought some here today, but we weren't allowed to bring yeah. liquids. So you could the have Scottish Water say it. that it doesn't have uh, a significant taste or odour, you know, unlike chlorine, which can be stronger. Well, that's, that's not, not the case. We, I, no, it's, it tastes metallic now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think we also think it's possibly, we don't, not sure, but it could be, it's the source. The Since water source. The water source. Mm -hmm. I do have sensitive information here that I don't want. The press have been hounding us. I don't want the press to get hold of this. I, I would really like you guys to see this mm -hmm. because it, I think it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. As I said to you before, all of the materials that you provide for us, we'll make sure the committee has um, sight yeah. of those. Yes. Um, yeah. OK. Morris Good morning, ladies. Um, the, our briefing refers to the DWR's two, two, 2015 annual report, and that provides statistics on compliance and what it refers to as contacts, I quote, from consumers who are dissatisfied with the quality of their supply. It says that there, are, that there was 99.92% compliance with the standards set out in legislation and the EU drinking water directive. Uh, and it reports that only 0.2% of consumers reported concerns with the quality of their supply. What are your thoughts on those figures, ladies? Okay, if you look, um, <laughs> if, if you look at the results... Oh, Caroline first. Okay, if you look at the results, Scottish Water printed their results from 2012 to 2015. There's this huge, great, big, the whole load of um, measurements... And a lot of them just go less than 2.7. You know, you look through the, the results, and they from the top to the bottom, they don't change, okay? Which, that doesn't happen when you monitor something. Um, a, lot of the gap, a lot of the gaps are f empty, and only twice in the whole of that time where they, they did they noticed that there was a smell of chlorine. And it's only twice within those, in the, those 2012 to 2015 that they, monitor, they actually wrote in their notes. Okay, so if they don't put in their notes that, that it doesn't smell of chlorine, then of course they're going to fulfill the parameters because then they're not... They're not putting the information down to be assessed. Mm -hmm. um, what was the first bit? You said there was no, something no, so else. Basically, which I, I had thoughts on those figures. Basically, the, the, the low percentage of um, consumers who reported concerns, 0.2%. Okay, was, also. That was the yeah. official figure they put out. Consumers the don't. Have you, have you challenged them on that? No, I haven't challenged them, but we know from our experience. Sorry, Leslie. No, sorry. Sorry. But we know from our experience that people do not complain because they are not listened to. They are absolutely fed up with not being listened to. But then you've, got, you've got the other hand, you've got Scottish Water that have had numerous meetings um, throughout the Strath in all the different villages and had public meetings constantly and attended the Association of Community Council, oh. Councils in the National Park and they're constantly meeting. So if that was the case and there was no complaints, why would they be running all these meetings? They're running all these meetings to try and alleviate the problems that we're having in our communities. They came to a, be they came to a meeting. Leslie went to a meeting. They, Scottish Water, she was arguing with her, sorry, arguing with her husband coming up the stairs because th they were going to be late. And the room was full of people. And she said, it's OK, you're the first people here. Leslie, w were you we were looking in the window and I could see <laughs> loads of people in the room and I thought, how can I be the first people here? I can actually see people in front of me. And um, it turned out afterwards that they were all Scottish Water employees. I'd been so, in. So people are arriving, like me, thinking this is community that's all turned up to hear a meeting. And then you're thinking, well, wait a minute here, you don't know who, who's in the room because there's people there that are not in our community. So They, they hold a meeting and... 
they, they get everybody, they separated everybody. They said, right, you write your questions. You weren't down. allowed to ask you weren't questions. Allowed, you weren't allowed to sit in a room and listen to everybody else's opinion. They got, Scottish Water got people to write on a piece of paper and say your concerns so they would individually answer your questions. And we said to them, well, we don't know what other people are asking from other villages and what other concerns people are having. She said, well, we'll sum it all up for you at the end. But that's not a public meeting. A public meeting is when people in the public can go and Ask. speak out and then you can speak to other people and find out. So that's why in Bad Knock and in 2016, the Water Action Group was set up so we could bring all the information from all the villages across the Strath together and we start monitoring and write down all the complaints, the health complaints, and we go to the doctors and we go to the pharmacists, and now we've managed to pull all this information together. So Scottish Water can't turn around and say to us, we've got no complaints, we don't know about all this, because we do know they know about it, but after five years, they don't want to address it. We did our own survey to see whether we should come to see you. We can give you all of that information. Okay, that would be helpful too. Um, Angus MacDonald? Okay, thanks, convener. <coughs> Just following up on, on the meetings um, that were held, according to our, our briefing um, on Scottish Water's web page, it says that five information events were held in May and June 2016 with a follow-up information event and public meeting um, held in March 2017. Um, now, from your comments just now, it's, I think it's fair to say that you were less than impressed with... We got a very, very difficult time in 2016 because I think now our residents have had enough. We're buying that. bottled water, we're having to um, get our springs reopened up again, we're paying for a product that none of us can use, and I think people are now, after five years, we're at the end of our tether. We need the water. Water is the most vital of basics and if we can't get that we, we we have to look alternatively to where we can get drinking water okay just for the record did you both attend these all these meetings yeah no i didn't attend I, i've them. attended most of them okay and we know that scottish water plan to hold a further event uh, for residents in, in november ba badenach and stutzby in november do you intend to go along to that one yes both of you yes yeah Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brian Whittle. Yeah, your, your petition calls for an independent research into the safe uh, contamination of drinking water. Our, our briefing identifies a variety of sources of evidence regarding the health effects of chloramine in drinking water. What is your response to the fact that these sources, uh, the World Health Organization, the United States Environment Protection Agency, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and the International Agency for Research on Cancer have referred to limited evidence a lack of published evidence or inadequate evidence? Well, you've just said it, lack of evidence. The who, we are under the EU directive. Um, you're not, according to the EU directive, you are not allowed to put anything into the water that is potentially damaged, damaging to health. Um, we've got photographs, we've got skin complaints, we've got loads of information that the water I mean, is affecting people's health. NHS is pretty, um, I mean, it's stre stressed quite a bit, as everybody knows, listening to the news. I mean, if this is another tip of the iceberg where there's all these people attending hospitals and everything, I mean, surely this should be taken into account now. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you said about that information. The Scottish Government, the, the, the um, Cranfield University um, that did, did, did the study that I spoke about, they were commissioned by the Scottish Government and they came back saying there wasn't enough information. Can I ask Kate Forbes? Thanks very much. Um, thank you for that information. Obviously, over the last um, few months, uh, I have been aware of um, people's concerns um, to do with taste, um, odour and uh, skin um, concerns. I wondered if you could sketch out for the committee the impact that you are um, aware of in terms of what people's um, concerns are. So you well, mentioned talking buying bottled water, for example, yeah, being one example. 
they ha the, the bottled water has increased in our area because people can't drink it. It's affecting it. We, we are, in Aviemore, we've got a wide tourist industry and people come for holidays and whatever. And they, they, they have to explain to people in the restaurants and the hotels that when they ask for tap water, well, we can give you it, but you can't really drink it. So that's having a, an effect on our tourism industry. You've got families that are on maybe lower incomes. We're not even though it's a lovely area, a lot of people that work in this industry and have more, they're not on really high wages. So a lot of their wages are now going on buying the bottled water. And um, it, it, it's very, very difficult because we used to have, I would say, the best water supply when it came from the top of the mountain. It was just... And, and for now to have the worst water supply they did a on the one show they did a taste testing and they took our water and they took manchester's water and they, i think they took it to perth but i'm not sure about that and they got people to taste it and we watched it and of course they were all saying this is the highland water and this is the water for manchester and they were physically spitting it out when they were tasting the highland water because they couldn't believe what they were drinking so i'm <laughs> I don't know what we, I went to the doctor. Um, I went to the doctor. I spoke to Doctor Yahatsi, who's just retired from um, Avimo. from Avimo surgery, and he said statistically, um, the with the children, it's a very transient. Avimo is a very transient young population, so lots of people come in and go out. But he said statistically, the kids are getting really badly affected by this. And it's and they know statistically, and if a child has got eczema, and its hands are all bandaged up and bleeding, this affects the whole family. They can't sleep. Sorry, they can't sleep, and so the whole the whole family is affected. And brief one. In ter obviously, since the water supply changed in 2012, there have been additional changes to the, the water supply, whether that's flushing it out or adding in April this year the, the chloramination. Um, what difference have you noticed in terms of what people's concerns are over that time? On the Facebook page, they have a, we have a Strathspey and Badenoch Water Action Group that, that, that's on Facebook, so that monitors the whole of the, the valley, and that's been very good um, at keeping tabs on what's going on, and there doesn't seem to be any change. Um, and can you see people put on on Tuesday the... the, the even boil, see boil in the water doesn't help um, with chloramination because it doesn't get rid of it. That was something that they didn't. Scottish Water never told. Lots of people in the Strath have um, things to filter, filter the, water the water out, but now it's chloramination. You can't do that. It's the chloramination is a very stable product. That's why they use it. It stays in the pipes for much longer, but you can. It, can't it's filter. very difficult to remove it on it, and you cannot remove it with a tabletop filter. You have to get specialist equipment, but Scottish Water never told us that when we were in, when it was introduced. Okay, then further questions? No, in that case, can I thank you very much um, for your um, evidence today and for I think a lot of issues there that we want to pursue further. And it's really just a question of what we now do in relation to um, this petition, Brian. I think fun fundamentally for me, it, it's the, the question is who, who's testing the water and, and what are the test protocols and who's analysing the results and recommending and who's, who has the power to enforce the recommendations and whether there's any conflict of interest there. And I think with, with, with that in mind, we probably really should look at, um, at maybe asking uh, DWQR, Scottish Water or um, SIPA. Uh, to, to, to give evidence here because it, it, it is a recurring issue. I think not. Not just. Uh, in this I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it would be important, obviously, to give Scottish Water the opportunity to respond anyway, and maybe yeah, we'll yeah. see whether that had been an evidence session or not. I think we should write to Scottish government so that we can understand their role. We know the Parliament has a role in, in um, scrutinising the work of, of Scottish Water in their reports. So I think we would be want to write to Scottish government, Scottish Water, the regulator, SIPA. Um, Another suggestion might be the Water Industry Commission for Scotland. Um, and I'm wondering whether there are groups that we should be asking about, because I'm quite interested in the way in which they've consulted the idea that you have a public meeting, but everybody's spoken to individually. It's quite unique in my experience. Not quite unique. It is unique. It's a new modern way of 
um, having a public meeting. All right, okay, so, so to avoid the, people shouting at you, you just <laughs> you deconstruct the meeting. Um, and obviously, I don't know if there are particular questions that folk, well, you've already said, Brian, are there other questions that we would want to be flagging up with, with these organisations? One group, uh, Chair, is, is the Bad Knock and Strass Bay Water Action Group, who seem to take a lot of um, time in this. Maybe we should ask them to come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Angus? Convener, I think also given the concerns that have been raised regarding the health impacts, um, we, I don't know if it would be in order to write to the uh, GPs in Aviemore, but certainly uh, the Health Board in general to ask for their views. Something. There was a... Um, NHS research paper synopsis. I don't know what this is, but the highlights the lack of convincing data from long-term studies into the effects of public health of chloraminated water. Okay, it'd be good if you could share that uh, or a link to that with with the clerks. Um, um, but I, I think don't. Uh, we just. Okay, well we can we yeah. can tr trace it. Um, but I think we should certainly write the health board and ask for their mm -hmm. views as well. And I suppose, I mean, from the Scottish Government's point of view, I think it's to go back to the point that Rona makes, that this is, there are very specific issues that you're describing, but this committee has almost wanted to look at what are the national implications for that, or the policy implications of that more generally. I suppose to conduct an inquiry into your water supply, want to know if there are issues there that are not being addressed because of the, the, gen, the, the petition itself specifically focuses on the role of the, of the regulators. So we really want to know, you know, what measurements there are, how do you respond to consumer concerns and, and those kinds of issues. Directives would be interesting to explore as well. Um, I find it hard to believe that a, a large public body would not be adhering to EU regulations and you know so we, we'd need to uh, we need to, to um, tease that one out because okay. um, I think the petitioner said that there's certain things that um, can't be put into water under EU regulations and I, I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure that Scottish water will be sticking to that, but uh, we need to sort of find that out. Um, well, because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, drinking water uh, the disinfectant byproducts, there's only one of them measured in Britain, and that's a TTHM, which is actually reduced by using chloramines. Um, they don't add, because, well, that's what I was saying about the cumulative, they don't add them all up. And the EU directive says that the, you must have a total of those, all of those, and they have to be, be with under, under 100, it's a little what funny thing that I don't, G, something G, a per litre, but because only one of them is regulated, they can't, they can't add them all up because only one of them is measured. So you're not, you, that's what, yeah. I mean, I think from the point uh -huh. of view of the committee, we recognise, um, and we hear what you've said about your concerns, we want to see Gen in the general context, is there a structure in place that addresses those problems wherever they emerge? So I think my sense is the committee thinks it would be worthwhile, A, to get more evidence, but also to have oral evidence. We might be discussed further at some point, but what that looks like once we've got initial responses from the, all the different groups, people that we've identified. Yeah. Angus? Yes, yeah. yeah, thanks, Camina. I wonder if it would be in order to inform the ECCLR committee at this early stage uh, at least of today's transcript, um, given that they've got oversight of um, Scottish Water, SEPA, and um, the DWQR, um, just to make them aware of the, the, the situation um, and, and keep them in, in the loop with regard to any further evidence that's taken. One of the discussions that we had at the conveners group when I was presenting on the public petition, the role of public petitions, was you know when we pass petitions over what's expected but also how do we ensure that there's a kind of a information exchange so that they know what we're considering that might be relevant to individual committees so we can make sure that we do that i think it'd be fair to say that we want to seek information responses but uh, following that we will be expecting we'd have further oral evidence to kind of address the general issues around how do you make sure individual concerns or localized concerns are, ex are dealt with by having a regulatory framework that's actually um, robust and obviously there's a lot of issues there that have been flagged up today that we would be keen to address with the relevant agencies that you've identified, including Scotch Water, the regulator and the government. If that's acceptable. Okay, in that case, can I um, thank you very much for your attendance and we'll suspend briefly.
to the second new petition for consideration, which is petition 1647 by Angus O'Henley on protection for all employees in NHS Scotland. Mr O'Henley was unable to attend the meeting, but members have a copy of the petition and a note by the clerks. The petition calls for the creation of a specific statutory offence covering the assault of any employee within NHS Scotland whilst that employee is carrying out any patient service. The petition acknowledges the protection that is provided to certain employees under the Emergency Workers Scotland Act 2005, but considers that there is a gap in the legislation which means that other employees within the NHS do not have the same protection. He says that this will often be frontline staff, such as admin or reception staff, posters, cleaners, Porters, my apologies, cleaners or auxiliary and trainee nurses. The clerk's note refers to the spice briefing, which advises that any such assault can already be prosecuted under existing criminal offences, such as the common law offence of assault. Paragraphs 5 to 7 of the clerk's note provides, provide further context in respect of the 2005 Act. It notes that the petition refers only to assault and does not refer to obstruction or hindering, which are also offences under the 2005 Act. Section 5 of the Act does offer protection on hospital premises to anyone assisting doctors, nurses, midwives and ambulance staff without the requirement for this to be in an emergency situation. The SPICE briefing also refers to the Protection of Workers Scotland Bill, which was introduced by Hugh Henry in 2010. While there was no disagreement that workers who serve the public deserve protection, there was not agreement about how best that might be achieved without duplicating existing legislation, and the bill fell at stage one. Paragraphs 17 to 21 of the clerk's note cover sentencing and suggest that by highlighting this issue, sentences might become tougher when taking account of any aggravating factors. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on this petition. Brian. Just for my clarification, are we, are we suggesting that, or is, sorry, is the petitioner suggesting that uh, the, the offence of, of assault or, or whatever um, uh, within a, 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 a medical environment or NHS environment should have a higher level of sentence. Is that, is that what we're asking here? I think my understanding is it's, it's to underline the seriousness of it. And originally, if my recollection is right, the context for the, the original bill in 2000, or the original act in 2005, was a recognition, for example, that firefighters were being called out in emergency and were then being ambushed. Yeah. Um, by young people assaulting, throwing stones at them and so on. So that in an emergency situation, somebody was at risk and then to be assaulted at that point seemed something you wanted the courts to recognise as a very significant thing, as an aggravation. The then, the, the debate that then emerges after that is, is it just in emergency situations that are at risk? Are it just emergency workers that are just at risk? And, in fact, Hugh Henry's um, legislation was to some extent prompted by, I think, the Shop Workers Union, Osdo, where they recognise that people in retail can very often be put in a position where they're um, at risk as well. So it, it, it feels to me that, that the legislative proposals have all been driven by the same thing, which is a recognition that people are going about their business, trying to do a particular job in, in frontline job, trying to provide a service to then be assaulted or attacked is is a significant thing they would want the courts to take into account. I think where always the argument has been where is the balance lies in terms of actually legislating for that. And, and, and it wouldn't, um, it would take a, a, an existing part of common law and replicate it as a, as a new offence. It wouldn't actually um, extend any new protections because the, because the, you know, the, the laws all, all of protection is there, mm -hmm. but um, as you say, it could it could highlight it. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's the same argument, like a lot of like stalking legislation, or mm -hmm. I haven't looked in detail at domestic abuse legislation, but mm -hmm. it is to say, well, yes, these things could be pursued as a, a breach of the peace or a, yeah. an assault. However, if you place it in the context of a broader set of behaviours, you can then recognise that this has been a. Um, mm. You know, an attack that's, that's motivated. Well, hate crimes the same thing. It, it tries to recognise context, motivation as well. I think. But it's. I, 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 I sense from the committee we recognise that Mr. Henley's petition is is identifying an issue yeah. that we are sympathetic to. We recognise that it's not just doctors and nurses and so on. That there are a lot of people working in health service trying to do their best. And the idea that they would be assaulted in the workplace. Um, it's, not, it's not something that's acceptable. I suppose the question is whether the proposals that he identifies are the ones that 
would solve that problem and it may be that we should would it be worthwhile testing that a bit maybe asking for a response from people who might have an interest in the question it seems that this um the petitioner's calling for this to apply to nhs employees effectively whereas i guess i guess you could say that as you said earlier you could extend it to assault at work whatever that may be whether you're you know a bus driver or a or, or a shop retail worker you know, focusing on, I'm trying to put words into his mouth, but that it's not just the the the, um, the people who are in um, you know who have got a medical role within a hospital who are maybe placed at risk. When we, we will all know of anecdotal evidence of people who are trying to manage the process being abused, you know, whether it's the the receptionist at the GP surgery or somebody, you know, the porters working in the hospital trying to do their best and become the focus of aggression. And I think it's. The question is not, for me, we, that distinction, we do, we, we do want to recognise that, these, that the folk doing those jobs are equally deserving of protection. The question is whether the, the, the model suggested by the petitioner is, is, would work and would have the desired effect. I mean, Jay, you've got the situation of the, the ticket collector on the train. Yeah. I mean, there is the law to protect, I mean, any assault. I mean, I've seen it when it running factories. I've had people who've been assaulted and they've got the police in and they've been charged. Mm -hmm. So why can't we use that law? I think, um, I think yeah, but I think my, my question is is that uh, the, the assault of, of as you've um, highlighted, Chair, the, the assault of a, a fireman attending an emergency or, or, or an ambulance attending an emergency, we've all, you see we've all heard anecdotal evidence, whether that constitutes you know, a, a higher level of, of the same offence. I think that that's kind of where I was looking at. And I think whether the practicalities of that, would be interesting to hear from like, the Crown Office or, or something like that, whether the practicalities of that are... Because I think we'd all recognise that the, 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 you know, the, the petitioner's highlighting an issue, but whether, that's, whether there's a practical solution to that. Can I suggest, then, we, we do try and find out some more. Um, we're not ruling it out completely, so we want to test it against the views of... The Scottish Government, I think you're right to talk about um, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. Um, be interested to know what the, the unions in the health service have a view on this. Um, I don't know whether the Law Society routinely comments on these questions, but I think they quite often they will have a view about whether adding legislation actually adds protections or not. It's worthwhile hearing from them. Anyone else? Start, I think, mm -hmm. for us, yeah. So, whichever organisation, like the you know the unions, Royal College of Nursing, um, British Medical Association, NHS Scotland, um, I don't know whether the Health and Safety Executive would they be? Would they have a view? But these, I mean, we can. If there are further suggestions of organisation, might seek information from. Definitely, with a view to how yeah. it could be actually carried out. Yeah. Okay, so we, I think in conclusion, we're recognising there is an issue being highlighted here. Yes. Whether this is the solution is a separate question, but we, it would be worthwhile um, examining that further. Okay, if we can, um, if we can then move on to the next item in the agenda. Um, agenda item three. Um, on continued petitions. We, the next item on the agenda is two continued petitions. Petition 1480 by Amanda Copel on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness and Petition 1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland against the care tax on abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. And I understand that the petitioner Amanda Copel is in the public gallery and I would want to welcome her to today's consideration of, of the petition. Um, members will recall that we took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport at our last consideration of the petition. We discussed a number of issues, including the remit and timescale for the feasibility study. And members will see from the papers that this is likely to be completed in the summer. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. the results of the feasibility study that um, and obviously requests that the cabinet secretary does have a, a meeting with the petitioner 
uh, and then we consider the results, the feasibility study that's, that's then carried out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anything? so that I agree with that, yeah. It would be important for us, obviously, to have an opportunity to look um, at the feasibility. I mean, my sense is that people feel very strongly that there is an issue here. That there's a, um, and there is actually a question for us at some point whether we want to separate off these two petitions, because they're, although they're, they're dealing with the same area, they might be you know, pursuing slightly different issues. And I know myself that in relation to the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. There's a, there's a question there about, in, in the context of people's human rights, that actually if you need access to services in order for you to be able to achieve your potential and to do things, and you're being charged for those, um, and it prevents people then don't access those services and perhaps at a later stage that they, they need more support. So it kind of is counterintuitive. It doesn't really, it's creating it's not focusing on preventative and early intervention, and it's creating um, more problems further down the line. Um, I think there is some recognition that the feasibility study itself um, is important to people, um, but we want to be reassured about what, you know, the time scale for that, and um, the, you know what what I, what the expectations of that feasibility study would be. And I know that before. There was an issue about people saying, oh, well, there's an implications for cost, but there wasn't, it appeared that there wasn't really any work done on what that, that might be. Yeah. Are there any other comments people might have? Yeah, I think the feasibility study is key, key to, to, to how we proceed with it. But I do think there's a, there's a strong argument for separating the two petitions. That may be something we could look at at a later stage. Yeah. Now, I suppose the other thing is to check whether um, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport um, would ask her officials to meet with the petitioner to discuss the feasibility study. I think that would give people confidence that it was being... That those kinds of concerns, maybe from both lots of petitioners, that, that they were getting that opportunity really to sort of focus with the officials on what these concerns were, because obviously these campaigns have been, I think, particularly effective in highlighting... highlighting um, an injustice, and there has been some movement. It would be important that that communication was continued, so perhaps we could agree to do that as well. Yes. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, in that case, um, again, recognising, I think, the importance of the, the myriad issues that are in these two petitions, it's not something we want to um, let go of at this point. We were very keen to see the outcome of the feasibility study, but we were particularly keen that that feasibility study was informed by the views and experience, the direct experience, um, of the petitioners themselves. So with that, if we can um, move on to petition um, 1577 on adult cerebral palsy services. The next item on the agenda is petition 1577 by Rachel Wallace on adult cerebral palsy services. Members will recall that we took evidence from the Minister for Public Health and Sport at our last consideration of this petition. We have received a submission from the petitioner and members will also see that the clerk's note provides some additional background information from SPICE. Um, I want, at this point, if I can welcome Murder Fraser, MSP, for this item. Members may recall that the Minister and her officials considered that a national clinical pathway would not be appropriate for a condition such as cerebral palsy. They propose that developing practices at a local level is the way forward for now. The Scottish Government has been working with Bobath Scotland in this regard and they will consider what learning can be shared from, what the, from that with health boards. We understand that Capability Scotland is also conducting a national mapping exercise of therapy provision for cerebral palsy in Scotland. As these projects have only recently concluded, we are yet to have the Scottish Government's view on what action it will take in response to the findings of this work. The petitioner takes the view that the Scottish Government should take the lead at national level, whether that is in the form of a national clinical pathway or other framework, to ensure that adults with cerebral palsy can access the continuity and specialist care and services that they require. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I wonder, Murdo, it might be useful maybe for you to uh, make some comments now to help us inform what our views might be. Uh, th thank you, Convener. Thank you for letting me uh, address the committee. I did have a discussion with the petitioner around the evidence session that was that was held with the minister 
uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and while I think there was some, some very helpful things said um, in terms of that evidence, I think the petitioner's biggest concern is that uh, we don't lose sight of the um, ambition to have a national clinical pathway. I think what the minister said in her response was they were looking at developing local pathways. And I think the, the petitioner's concern is that, uh, that what that would lead to would be, in effect, a, a, a very mixed and patchy picture across the country um, where some health boards would no doubt do well and, and, and take this forward expeditiously. Other health boards might not. Uh, we know that health boards are suffering from, in many cases, uh, issues with their finances, issues with staff shortages, and it might not be seen as a priority. And I think the petitioner was very keen to, 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 to reinforce a message that she, was, she wanted to see this taken forward on a national level and with national leadership from uh, Scottish Government, rather than it just being left to the discretion of individual health boards to take this forward. Um, also, I think the work that's been ongoing with uh, Bobath Scotland and, and Capability Scotland has been very helpful, um, and I'm interested to see how that develops. Um, uh, and uh, to get some feedback from, from those exercises in due course, I think, would, would be very helpful. But um, in terms of giving us the, uh, the, the impetus that the petitioner would like to see, I think we'd, we'd, we're keen that it's, it's not lost sight of as a national clinical pathway. I wonder if you can help us, uh, and I think it is referred to in, in the response from the petitioner, that other comparable conditions that would have national pathways? Because I think that's the thing we're wrestling with. I'm not quite clear, even from the evidence, why there would be resistance to that at national level. Why, because there are other conditions where there would, there would be an expectation of those pathways? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't have enough medical knowledge to, to, to say how cerebral palsy fits in with the hierarchy of other, other conditions. But if you take an example, for example, motor neuron disease, where we've seen a great deal of impetus behind that over the last year and where the Scottish Government have provided a lead in making sure that uh, local health boards are providing additional support for those who are suffering from MND. I think that's the sort of parallel you can see where if the government determines something needs to be addressed, they can actually give a lead to it and make sure that uh, uh, at a local level health boards actually deliver rather than it just being left to individual health boards to decide that what action they're taking themselves. And is there a consistency across the country at, when they're still, when, as children with cerebral palsy, kind of an expectation of a particular kind of support right across the country, but it's a transition to adulthood that's causing the problem? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's absolutely the point, uh, in that children's services, according to the petitioner anyway, are actually quite, quite robust, um, and children uh, with, with cerebral palsy are, are generally you know, well, well cared for and get the attention that, that they require. I think the problem with, is with the transition to adulthood where too many people seem to just, just, just f fall off the edge of a cliff when it comes to the support that they require. Okay. Any comments from the committee on how we take it forward? Brian? I think, I think the, 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 there's, there's obviously um, the, the baseline is that everybody's an individual and everybody will have uh, separate needs, but that doesn't prevent there being a national framework in which uh, there should be there should be a, a, a fairly uh, robust approach, or a similar approach, um, uh, to to establishing what the individual needs would be. So I think for me that's uh, and and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here uh, if you think I'm wrong, but um, that uh, that to me seems to be realistic. There should be a framework in place that, that uh, enables that individual individual uh, treatment um, uh, protocols to be established. In reading the evidence that uh, the petitioner herself has to seek out her own um, physiotherapy and, and also identifying that there'll be physiotherapists who wouldn't be able to, who wouldn't be, you know, um, have the knowledge in order to deal with her yeah. condition, but that that still didn't reflect that there should be national guidance on it. So, um, I think it is something we want to pursue a little further. I think if I'm, my sense from the committee. Um, that we would maybe ask the Scottish Government for the findings from the pilot programme and the mapping exercise, um, and also, I think, to get a further assessment from the Scottish Government on the way forward, presumably informed by this, the bits of work that they've done, including whether it will produce national guidance for health boards. I mean, I suppose it's, it, 
I suspect for the petitioning and, and for ourselves, the technicality of the language they use to describe what that is, whether it's a pathway or whatever, isn't as important as there being a national view of what it's reasonable for an, a, an adult with cerebral palsy to expect and to be able to access. Would that be... Yeah. Of whether it's national or local, we need, we need to sort of know uh, the time frame, I think. Yeah. Okay, so if we can write to Scottish Government in those terms, um, and seeking a, a time time frame, it's doing that. My sense is, I don't know whether the findings... Do, do we have a time scale for the pilot programme? I think it's finished. Oh, it's already finished, so we can get that information. It's obviously what the matter was saying is about the, the national element of putting something in place. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be fair to say the committee has found that argument a convincing one, and if you to hear an argument against it, there may be a compelling argument, but it's not one that we've that we feel as if we've we've heard, and that we would be keen for the Scottish government to both give us information on the the pilot program, the mapping exercise, and you know. Will they produce national guidance for the health boards? Precisely, I think, for the point that you, that Murdo Fraser makes, that mm. at a time where people are making budgeting decisions, then the context of national guidance becomes very important. OK? OK, if that's agreed, thank you very much. <clears throat> if we can move on, then, to petition uh, 1581, Save Scotland School Libraries, which was lodged by Duncan Wright on behalf of Save Scotland School Libraries. The petition calls for a new national strategy for school libraries, which recognises the vital role of high, school qu high quality school libraries in supporting people's literacy and research skills. Members will recall that our previous consideration of this petition, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills said that it had been persuaded by the petitioner's argument and that it is his intention to formulate such a strategy. The petitioner welcomes the Deputy First Minister's commitment, acknowledging that it, quote, fully supports the original aim of the petition. He seeks detail on how the strategy will be developed and delivered, who will be involved in any consultation, what the timescale is for the strategy to be in place, and whether as part of the strategy, national standards will be established for schools across Scotland. The petitioner suggests that Killips should be involved in the development of the strategy and that it would be of great benefit to the future success of the strategy if Mrs Swinney explained the rationale behind it to representatives of COSLA and ADES. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Deputy First Minister's evidence um, to us was very positive and, and it's obviously been recognised here. Um, so there's, there's no issue with any of that, but it, it might it might be um, a, a, an idea to to respond to the petitioner's request to, to request further detail on the strategy, just to yeah. pick out certain elements mm -hmm. of, of what was said during evidence. But I don't think there's, there's any issue that uh, anyone's unhappy with what's happening um, at the moment. Okay. We must, be, we must be quite close to a point where we can. Uh, Draw a line under this yes, one. Yes, I suppose I mean, that's yeah. the only question is whether we close the petition now, given that the original request by the petitioner has been agreed, or whether we would look for this further information first. So, because I suppose that, that what the petitioner wants is some confidence that it's not just a strategy that may be developed at some point in the future, but there is now a, a time scale for it, and in fact that the government is addressing the, the concerns of COSLA and ADES, who I think we're more sceptical yeah, but uh -huh. questions that clearly doesn't know the answer to so I think it might be worthwhile to to um, to write mm -hmm. right to the well, deputy first minister yeah, I agree. yeah. <coughs> um, n normally convener I would I would move to close the petition but I think um, well particularly given the deputy first minister's uh, um, full support uh, for the original aim of the petition mm -hmm. Uh, and, of course, the fact that he's given a commitment to deliver mm -hmm. uh, a national strategy. But that said, um, I think the petitioner is right to seek uh, a little bit further uh, clarification. So happy to go with uh, the other members on this. OK, if we agree to that, but I think also to reflect ourselves that actually this is an issue where very finely balanced whether we close it now, but the, I think the expectation will be that having got the information from the Deputy First Minister, that, that would be something that we would be expecting to do. Um, and recognising both, um, I suppose, the effectiveness of the petitioner, but also that the, the Deputy First Minister 
did move in the way that he did, in a very positive way, and from the petitioner's point of view. OK, if we can then move on to um, petition 1591 by Katrina MacDonald on behalf of SOS NHS on major redesign of healthcare services in Sky, Loch Alsh and South West Ross. And can I wel welcome Kate Forbes, MSP, and Rhoda Grant, MSP, who are present for this petition. Members have a note by the clerk, along with the most recent submissions from the Cabinet Secretary and the petitioner. The Cabinet Secretary's submission appears to indicate that she is confident that appropriate consideration has been given to any unintended consequences of the redesign, and that she is content that due process has been followed. She also makes clear her expectations of the work required by NHS Highland to ensure full engagement with local stakeholders. However, the petitioners appear still to have concerns that they are not being listened to or fully engaged with, and that is perhaps a matter for the board to consider. Um, and before I ask members for their comments or suggestions, I wonder if I can ask Rhoda Grant and Kate Forbes if they have um, a view on the progress that has been made or um, the response from the minister. Yep, um, I think um, the most important line that you just mentioned was in Shona Robinson's letters about the expectations required. And I think that the issue here is matching up what has been promised, what is being expected and what people feel is really happening on the ground. Um, and also around uh, the, the engagement with the community. It still remains a, a matter of concern for um, most people in the north end of Skye in particular, about what about having confidence in the redesign and, and what this will mean for them. In particular, we've raised um, issues of concern in the past, but again, it's around um, care beds in the north end. And last time I was here, I mentioned the closure of another care home. So there is um, growing pressure on care beds for early, elderly or palliative care. Um, and also for emergency um, care and emergency services provision in the North End. Um, so that, that those remain a concern, along with um, Ronald McDonald, who has previously submitted evidence around the um, mandatory national guidelines and taking into account the density of the population in the North End. So I feel my role is this morning to try and represent the views of those who have continued to write to me and raise their concerns with me around um, the provision of beds currently, the provision of emergency services currently, and also um, the redesign process taking into account the density of population. I should also add that there are um, other parts of Sky, so the South End, um, where the, at the moment the, the redesign suggests the new hospital should be, who are content at the moment, obviously with, with a new hospital in their area, although um, have also made clear that they too would like to see um, more services being uh, committed to in the north end of Skye. And really the question I think for the committee this morning is um, whether it's worth asking for more evidence or asking for the petitioners to come back and uh, make their views known um, as a sort of final point and as to whether the the whole process of what is being expected, what has been promised, um, marries with what people sense on the ground. Okay, thanks. Rhoda? Um, there's nothing I would disagree with in what Kate has said. I would add just a bit also about um, the ambulance service, both patient transport and emergency ambulances. I think there's real concerns that if people have to go to Broadford and, you know, especially in an ageing population, it's not always, you know, public transport isn't what it is in a city. It's pretty sparse. And if people aren't able to drive themselves, then that becomes a big issue to access health services and indeed visit people. Um, there are promises about better care in the community and the like, but nobody's seen the shape of this and the press reports are saying NHS Highland are looking to make more major savings from their budget. So I suppose if I was sitting there, I would be thinking, how are you going to deliver all the services with a, a budget that is contracting substantially? 
I've tried to think what the committee can do to to help with this, and I, I mean, I just throw this out as a suggestion. I don't know if it would be possible for the committee to do a round table with the health board and the petitioners to see if some of the issues that are really concerning them could be be answered in that, because I feel we're, the committee are just being passed back and forth, and we don't appear to have resolved very much for, for the petitioners. I don't know if that would be a way forward that the committee would would examine. Um, and indeed, if it was something the petitioners or indeed the health board would be willing to participate in. But it just feels to me there is still that gap. And, and you know, I've said, I think, all the time, and I'm maybe at odds with the petitioners in this, that we need to get on and have a new hospital in Sky because, you know, both hospitals are not fit for purpose anymore. Um, and any delay is going to mean that people not only have to bad enough travelling to Broadford, but if they have to travel to Inverness, it's going to be even worse. Um, so we need that new hospital, but I think we need to make sure that the whole of the community is content with the services that they're receiving and they know that they're going to ac be able to access health care without barriers in their way. I mean, I'm interested in, in the committee's views on, on what we do. I mean, at one level, the Scottish Government has said they're content that due process has been followed and people locally clearly don't agree with that. And, you know, I'm not sure if a round table would resolve that question. What it might highlight are the, um, what those actual individual anxieties are. But I wouldn't want to misrepresent what the role of this committee is. It's not a scrutiny committee in that sense that could establish X, Y and come to judgment on what's been done. We wouldn't have that role. So you wouldn't want unnecessarily to continue something mm. in the expectation there's going to be a resolution that we can't achieve for people. I think we have to be quite honest about what we can and can't do. Um, and I mean, I'm interested in views in the committee is because th there's a balance for us whether we close the petition on the basis that it's not going to be resolved through the petition process or is there something useful we can do that would eliminate some of the, um, the challenges that are there in terms of bringing the community together with the services that they, they're looking for and want to have confidence in? Brian? Uh, I mean, I, I, you kind of alluded to what I was going to say is that to me it seems like we have the Cabinet Secretary content with the, the process that's gone through, but, but, but at that, in the same time we haven't al allied uh, any concerns that we have with the, the, the petitioners and, and uh, the population there. So somehow or other, it, it, it seems to me there's a there's a role to be played, be, you know, to, between, you know, a, 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 a sort of communication between the two to try and find some, some middle ground. And, and the, now my question was, is is that is that the role of the petitions committee? Is that one of the you know what we actually do? Because uh, at the end of the day, it's it's two opposing uh, 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 ideas from the same same amount of evidence. Angus, um, I, I think you make some some valid points, convener, uh, as does. Um, Brian Whittle. Initially, I had a, a great deal of sympathy for, for this petition, and I've been keen to see uh, the committee um, do all that it can within, within its powers to assist the petitioners, um, given the, the, the quite valid concerns, um, which, which clearly continue amongst um, the population in Sky and, and perhaps not so much on the house side, but, but certainly in North Sky. Um, however, uh, I think given that the, the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that she's content that due process has been followed, um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, this, the, the, and as Kate Forbes mentioned, the south end of Sky is content, the north end of Sky is not so happy, and quite frankly, I, I don't see how that's going to change no matter how long we deliberate it here um, at, at committee. So I, I think the, the process has been exhausted. I don't see any benefit in having the petitioners back in um, to give further evidence, as Kate Forbes had suggested, and I don't see the benefit of a round table, um, because it's basically just prolonging uh, the situation um, where clearly the, the, the hospital has to be built uh, as soon as possible. So given that there's never going to be, um, you're not going to get the whole of the community to be content, um, I would move that uh, the petition be closed extremely reluctantly because, as I said, I, I did understand the, the, the concerns. But, as I say, I think we've exhausted the process um, and I would move to close. I'm interested in other people's comments on that. I suppose I 
what I would ask Rhoda and Kate is this question of the analysis done by was it Ronald McDonald. In that sense, that the, 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 wasn't, the process wasn't done properly, and the feeling that we've got back was that, that those specific, very definite points have not been responded to. Would it help? In, are people going to be more confident in the process if we ask the Minister to directly address those points, or is your view that that is discontinuing? I suppose that would be the one thing that I would... I, can, I see the force of what Angus has said, but is that the one thing we say, well, look, we've given it a final shot here. These are the, the, my sense from the petitioners, they feel that those questions have just been ignored rather than addressed. I mean, they can be addressed by the minister, saying, well, actually, we've checked it or whatever, but I wonder if you think that would help? I mean, I suppose the petition in, initially is asking for um, some sort of review, uh, and I have asked in the past, what are the, what are the, what is the, main concern is it lack of confidence in the process is it the outcome of the process in other words where the hospital is or is it thirdly gen a general sense of downgrading of the services and repeatedly people have said to me that their main concern is a confidence in the process so if the petition were able to um, ask for some for the cabinet secretary to um, just make sure that everything has been followed correctly in whatever form that would be um, then I, I think that would be profitable. Can I ask, a, can I ask the, the devil's advocate question? Do people complain about the process when they don't like the outcome? And even if we were to establish the progress, the process was right, if you're in the north of the sky and you're not happy, is it going to change anything? And that's not to belittle or demean their concerns. I wonder whether that's, is it through looking at the process you address the concerns or is there a next stage? which allows those concerns to be addressed. Because it can't just be with the location of the hospital, it's all the things round about, like transport, ambulance services, and so on. Rona? I, I think it would be worth, I mean, I, I broadly agree with, with what Angus said, except that there, there does seem to be unanswered questions. And if we were to keep it open, um, I, I don't think it's, as Angus said, worthwhile to have people back in for evidence, but um, I think, um, you know, maybe a letter to the Cabinet se Secretary asking the specific to, to relate to the specific concerns around access to primary emergency care and just highlighting those concerns to see what the response is. Um, that would be my only reason for, for really keeping it open, just to, to, to try and tie up those loose ends, not saying it would, it would give them the answer they wanted, but at least we would ask those questions for them. Yes, I mean, I entirely agree with what Ren is saying, because from my experience on Mull, we had exactly the same position there, and we managed to resolve it by specifically going in and talking about the reduction to access to primary and, and, and secondary care, emergency care, and that helped. So I, I, won't, I don't support closing it just now. I believe we should just do this one more letter to the Cabinet Secretary uh, to establish that, because it's about confidence in the north end of the island. I had this in the Ross of Mull. We got confidence back, and we resolved the issue. And the cabinet secretary confirmed it. Yeah, I would be content with that course of action. <coughs> Can, and I think, in response to what you're saying, we should be seeing to the cabinet secretary, or maybe to the health board as well, what measures are you now putting in place to build confidence? Because otherwise, the process is stalled, and nobody is benefiting from that. Very briefly. I think that over the last few months, and I've appreciated what the Petitions Committee have done in terms of going back and forth, and I know that the petitioners have appreciated it, but it's felt at times that there was sort of the same answers coming back. And so if in your letter you were able to really press the point that um, for some sort of tangible um, outcome that okay. could instill confidence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If that's agreed, then that's where I agree with that petition. Can I now uh, suspend the meeting because the Parliament has a across the country will be taking the opportunity to reflect on the events of um, the tragic events in Man Manchester and I want us to be able to participate in a minute's silence at 11 o'clock.
Call meeting back to, to order then, and can we move on to the penultimate petition on the agenda today, which is Petition 1603 on ensuring greater scrutiny, guidance and consultation on armed forces visits to schools in Scotland. And I understand that one of the petitioners, Mary Campbell-Jack, is in the gallery, and I'd want to welcome her to the meeting. Members will recall that our previous consideration of this petition was evidence from the Deputy First Minister, and having had the chance to consider the evidence, the petitioners have made a further submission, which we have in our papers. The petitioner's submission covers a range of issues, including the, the content of careers advice information and data they have compiled about armed forces visits to special schools in Scotland. On this last point, the petitioners urge the committee to recommend that no such visits are made. The petitioners also urge the committee to recommend a child rights and wellbeing impact assessment is applied to armed forces visits and that good quality data on armed forces visits to schools is requested. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions to make on how we might take this petition forward. Well, we're going to take some evidence from um, the armed forces themselves and the visit to school, I think. You know, until such times as we we hear that evidence, um, we would need to think about how in what format that that information would come. But that would be useful, and I think there are some of the questions that are raised by the petitioners, particularly around special schools data, well-being impact, and so on, that we could usefully test with them. Rona. And I think, again, it was a really positive session with the Deputy First Minister when he, when he gave evidence the last time, but I do think there are things that we could do um, just to follow that up um, because of some of the things that were uh, that he committed to. Um, and I, I'm actually very concerned about the, the Freedom of Information request that shows that 13 visits to special schools were made um, by the armed forces, so that might be something that we could... Um, Certainly, certainly bring up um, when, when we hear from um, when we hear some more evidence. Um, one of the uh, commitments made was that good quality data um, on armed forces visits to schools was requested, which was agreed to by the deputy first minister. But he also asked um, if we, if the committee would wish to specify what data uh, it thinks would help in that regard. And I'm not sure if we have actually provided those kind of that information so that he can carry that, that out. So that's something I think we should address because that, that was an important commitment that he made. Are there specific things that you might suggest, Rona, that, we, that you think um, that we should be particularly, there should I, I, be information I, on? Well, I, I just think numbers and areas and, you know, what particular schools have been visited and, you know, and, and postcode areas and things like that so we can get a picture of, of um, if there's any pattern, you know, emerging from that. Um, and the petitioner also requests the committee that um, a child rights and wellbeing impact assessment is applied to armed force visits to schools um, and that's something else that we could we could possibly um, press but that might come after we've we've had the briefing and things like that but, but I think certainly the, the data uh, point could be followed up now mm -hmm. um, if we, if we could just... I wonder if some of it is also about the purpose of the visits. We think that was something that came out of the evidence with the, the Deputy First Minister. I think, to some extent, he was addressing the question of careers visits, yes. when, in fact, we know that... And I think one of the concerns of the petitioners might be that there are softer visits, which are then used for recruitment purposes, when the other side of the argument would be, well, these are um, facilities or knowledge or information opportunities that... that you can bring into school, whether it's around mm -hmm. health and fitness or whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's like pulling that out. So yeah. that the use of one in order to recruit for the other is, is I suppose, yeah. at the heart of the petition. Yeah. yeah. I think, Chair, if I may say, the, the Welsh Government obviously have implemented some things, and some of the things that I find on my work in the cross-party group and veterans is quite useful, what they've done. I would like to see what they've come forward with on this, the Welsh Government. Because that might give us some help. Yeah. Okay. So I think some of it is about, um, I mean, I presume there is a spectrum of people who think that the armed forces shouldn't go into schools at all, right through to if there is a connection between the armed forces and an individual school, that should just go ahead. So we want information, data to give us an idea of what the patterns are and 
where that balance is and perhaps how the Welsh Government's response to this question would be useful in forming our views. Do you think I'm not, I'm not quite sure where, where we are with that? Is, is that something that... Um, no, no. That's something that's in hand, so we'll mm -hmm. pursue that. So um, it'll be happy. Yeah, because yeah. it was something that they offered, but I think the question will be in what format that would be, but we can... We so can ask that at that briefing there is the director of recruiting Scotland comes to that certainly in the three armed services um, and we don't want just a generic report I think okay. that would give us some substance chair okay because there are appointed seniors in that okay I think that's very helpful and I think that's you know again I think the committee is, is alive to the the balance that we want to strike here but the, the biggest conference you can have in the process is if you actually know where the armed forces are going why they're going there what sort of um, work is done round the question of whether, you know, is there an issue about special schools? The special schools themselves are so varied in their, in their purpose and their cohort, then it may be, be different in different places. But I think, I think historically, for the, from the petitioner's point of view, is, is, is getting the information that's been very difficult. So I think if we can bring that forward to make it more open and transparent, then that's a, a first step in, in dealing with the petition. Okay, so I think that we would want, wouldn't want to deal with the petition further, um, or would defer further consideration of the petition until we've had that briefing on the armed forces to schools um, provided by representative of the armed forces. And again, I think Maurice Corey's point about who we would hope to participate, part of that would be very um, useful. And we can, in the meantime, um, forward to the Deputy First Minister our suggestions around the data. Okay, so if that's agreed, we can then move on. To the final petition today, the final item on the agenda this morning is petition 1639 by Maureen McMillan on Enterprise Agency Boards and can I welcome Rhoda Grant back for this item. <laughs> Members will recall that we agreed to seek the petitioner's view on the ministerial statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity and we have now received her views um, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I don't know whether you want to say anything Rhoda and I know that you were liaising with the petitioner on this? Yes, just a, a couple of things. I think um, given the outcome of the review, I think people are pleased that the High Board has been retained. Um, but I think it's not clear what is going to happen coming out of the review. Um, we know that there is going to be an overarching cross-cutting board. We don't know fully the membership of that or indeed its role other than it won't be statutory and I wonder if the petition may be kept open to see what happens with that and if it does impact because uh, certainly some of the information I'm getting locally is that they're afraid that this will just happen by the back door rather than um, kind of up front and publicly. Another concern that people have been expressing to me um, and certainly it was something the petitioner spoke to me about, was that when this proposal was made originally, it was seen as kind of the last part of high that remained. And there was concerns that due to budget cuts, due to, you know, the reach of, of, of high itself um, had diminished over the years. And what people wanted was the high of the past back. And given Brexit coming up, given the amount of money that flowed from Europe to the Highlands and Islands, um, there is a real concern that that will mean that the Highlands and Islands will suffer and they need a strong voice in their corner speaking to government about allocation of resources to make sure um, that they understand peripherality in the way that Europe did, but neither of our governments really have it ever done, regardless of what shade. I'm not making a, a political point. There is a role for high to be strengthened and uh, represent the area. Otherwise, you know, it could be a very difficult situation we find ourselves in. So I make those two comments. Um, it may be that the committee want to pass it on to the Rural Economy Committee to look more in depth about in the role of high, or maybe just to hold the committee to see, to hold the petition to see the outcome of the cross-cutting board before they decide ultimately what um, to do with the petition. I wonder if people have views in this. And I think in terms of the actual petition, the petition has been successful in the sense that uh, High has been saved. I personally, um, 
a very supportive of a, a, a strong high with a strong social remit. I think all enterprise boards should have a, a social remit. I think it should be about people in place, but I think it's particularly important in the Highlands and Islands. But the question for us as a committee is whether that argument and that debate should be located in here, or will it naturally... The, the petition, in a sense, can't be the vehicle for that, I don't think, my sense would be, because it was very specific. There is nothing precluding anyone from bringing another petition to the committee on these questions. Um, and maybe I don't know whether Angus is, uh, has a view on what the rule of affairs, as I still call it, committee is, is doing on, on the question. I'm not on that committee, I'm on ECCLR, but um, yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with you, convener. Um, I was certainly delighted on the 20th of April, um, following the uh, public petition committee's evidence session in the morning, that the the government performed a, a volt fast uh, that afternoon. Um, I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, it was clearly a uh, pressure from members on all sides of the of the chamber uh, that it decided uh, to ditch the plans uh, that it had. So, and, and I think, uh, as I mentioned on the 20th of April, having had direct experience with the work of High and HIDB before it, um, the, the 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 need to retain that board uh, is is imperative. Um, but that said, I think the petition has done its job, um, as have uh, the members who, who campaigned. Um, and uh, as you say, convener, it's perhaps um, time for the petition to be closed. However, there is an opportunity for the petitioner to come back at a future date, should um, there be any, uh, as Rhoda Grant mentioned, or referred to backdoor um, actions there, but uh, um, I would hope that wouldn't be the case, clearly, uh, given given, there's, given that consensus broke out in the Chamber on the 20th of April. Um, so I, I would move to, to close the petition. Okay. Any other views? As well, I think we've gone as far as we can, and we, uh, the outcome um, was a good one, and um, I just really echo what I, I just said, no point in me repeating it. Any comments? It seems that the petitioner, for me, looking at the, the petitioner, has been successful. I think now, now the question that, that we're just asking is the implementation yeah. around that, and that's a that's a different it's a different question to the one that's been asked in yeah. the petition. I mean, we would be, I think as a committee we'd be gravely disappointed if it looked as if it was something to buy time and just you know actually is going to do the same thing in a different way. And I think again it would be across the parties there would be grave disappointment if this was sleight of hand rather than actually a change in. In policy position, Morris. Yes, I, agree. I agree. I think it's time to close. It's achieved its results, uh, its objectives, the committee, the petitioner. Um, but I think we have a keep a watching brief. Or, or, sorry, the Parliament will keep a watching brief on that and then pick up your point. And maybe the Rural Affairs or whatever committee, you know, it, it may come back in that form later on. Uh, certainly, personally, from the point of view of the evidence that we got from the petitioner, I think it was very compelling, very powerful. But actually, historically, what had been done. Um, the Highlands Islands by a, an agency that had that kind of remit and responsibility and you know I've made the example before about generational change but the opportunities for young people now to stay in the islands that were lost to my own parents generation so that is that it's something that we need to I think I would hope that the that uh, that evidence that was given by the petitioner had an effect, because I certainly think it had an effect in here, just that it was a broader context rather than some kind of just theoretical shifting round of the chairs around a table, um, and that we, it, we would be clear to the petitioner that we recognise those broader questions that have been highlighted, um, and that it would always afford, there is always an opportunity for a petitioner to come back with a new petition, which would maybe be addressing those concerns if it was felt necessary, if, that, if that's acceptable. Um, I think uh, we are agreeing as a committee that um, we're going to close the petition understanding order rule 15.7 on the basis the Scottish Government has decided to retain enterprise agency boards as part of its enterprise skills review and in that it has addressed specific concerns of the petition round HIE. So if that's agreed? In that case, can I thank Rhoda for her attendance and can I close the meeting?